Hi, this is Chris Jobling with another pre-sessional uh, presentation. This time we're going to talk about digital control. Um, and this follows on from the last few lectures where we've introduced the idea of digital systems, sampling, system responses. And last time we talked about ways we could uh, implement a continuous transfer function as a digital transfer function using what we call continuous systems equivalents. Uh, so now I want to show how these things all come together to produce uh, digital control systems. Um, that is implementation of control algorithms using computers or similar devices. So what I want to do in this, this lecture, in this presentation, is just basically set the scene um, to, to talk about how a digital control system typically set up, what kind of architecture it is, what kind of components you would use, and then talk a little bit about the relationship between S and Z and the implications that, that has, um, particularly on stability and the uh, sort of design space that we use to, to develop, develop control systems. Uh, I'll then show you how we can use the continuous system design techniques that we looked at last time um, by giving you an example. And we'll do the example in the class itself, but I'll, I'll set the scene for that. And then we'll, we'll look at what we do when we need to design completely in the digital domain. So this is a typical architecture for a control system. And we've got uh, the usual actuator and plant, which are continuous systems. You know, we're, we're controlling some variable here with a, uh, a reference. Reference is our desired value for this, so these, these two things are sort of related to each other. And our control system, what we really want to do is make, make uh, this value here equal to this value after a certain amount of time has passed. In order to do that, we, we typically measure the desired output, as we call it, with some kind of sensor circuit. And often the sensor has, has noise, and particularly because we're going to then digitize the, the resulting signal, we perhaps want to pre-filter that noise to get rid of any high frequencies that we couldn't sample very, very easily to sort of give the bandwidth limiting on the signal. And then we feed that signal, which we call the error, uh, into our digital compensator. And what I want you to think about is that the, the actual um, box here, this thing here, is really just equivalent to what we might have in a, a continuous control system. Um, but because it's implemented digitally, we've got a number of components that, that go with it. We, we're, we've got an analog digital converter, which is our sampling operation. So that converts E of T into a sample version of E of T. We then feed that into a CPU, where there's some code implementing some control algorithm of, of, or other. And that's producing a, a system output, an actuating signal. Uh, again, a sequence. That sequence is converted using a digital analog converter into a signal that can be fed into our plant. Obviously there would be other components perhaps in here to, to do power matching etc. And the whole thing is driven by a clock. So we've got what we call synchronous sampling. So the clock is, is driving the sampling of the signal that is coming in uh, repeatedly at a particular rate. It's controlling the output of the signal into the, into the system as well. And, it, and it's also responsible for uh, maintaining the, the processor itself and how quickly that, that works. So that, those are the sort of basic typical architecture of a control system. And apart from the fact that this thing in the red box here is digital, uh, it's very similar to any other sort of classical control system that we've looked at. So to move on, Um, we already developed this relationship last time. We looked at uh, how S and Z are related to each other. So um, we had this formula Z equals E to the ST, <coughs> which gives us a way to map um, from the S plane into the Z plane. And if we want to go the other way, we can use the inverse relationship S equals 1 over T times the natural log of Z. 
Now these, this, this, this sort of direct translation here has implications on stability and that kind of thing. So if we look at the next slide, um, this mapping, as it says here, maps from the S plane to the Z plane. So every point on the Z, on the S plane has an equivalent point on the Z plane, but the Z plane itself has some interesting properties. So for one one for one thing is and we'll perhaps, perhaps illustrate this with a uh, just by taking a, uh, a a pen here and drawing some pictures. Um, let's say we've got a pair of axes here, and uh, let's say we've got um, the, this is the S plane. So this is the imaginary axis. And of course, that's the stability boundary in control system terms. So everything in the shaded here region here is going to be an unstable response, and over here things are stable. So this boundary j omega is is the stability boundary. If we map that through the relationship, it's not difficult to prove that that stability boundary here actually maps into a circle unit circle. Not drawn very well on this picture, but you imagine a circle with the radius 1 uh, centered at the origin here in the z-plane. Um, now we have all kinds of uh, theories about stability for, for, that we're familiar with from the s-plane, but having this region here represented by a circle has some implications that uh, makes it more difficult to sort of come up with rules about stability and so on. And in addition, any other point in this plane will get mapped into some point in the z-plane, again using some kind of mapping possibly to here in the z-plane. Um, and we will look at some of those uh, mappings, I guess, a bit later on. So if I Clear, if I clear that, go back to my slides. So the stability boundary maps into unit circle. That's the first thing. Another thing that happens is that the maximum frequency in the z-plane is half the sampling frequency. This is due to Nyquist sampling theorem. Um, and it, that, that, that value here actually gets mapped onto the negative real axis in the z-plane. Uh, and there are other distortions that happen through this mapping that uh, are, are discussed in the in the exercise provided for the court for this, this particular session. Because stability is a, a unit circle, uh, we can't use around their wits and Nyquist tests because those those no longer apply when dealing with a unit circle. Um, there is a test called the jury test, but it's more involved uh, to apply. Also, the design curves that we've been using for root locus uh, for continuous system design, and the, the, the constant natural frequency, the constant damping ratio lines, constant uh, sigma d, which is related to rise time, and omega d, um, also get distorted by the mapping uh, z equals e to the st. And if you want to see the sort of distortion you get, then you can run the MATLAB command zgrid you get a picture that looks like this, and you can see the distortion on this on this grid. This is the unit circle. The, these are the, the these lines here are the lines of constant damping. These lines here are the lines of constant natural frequency, and you can see that although they are sort of the right shape in the very close to the origin here, they become much more distorted as we move across in frequencies, and, and also we get this. Uh, this maximum frequency in here. If we exceed that, we get what's called aliasing and pairing and that kind of thing. So it's a, it's a much more challenging space to work in, although we, we can still use root locus methods and that kind of thing. Um, we have to be aware that there's some quite a lot of um, our physical intuition of what's going on is, will be different in this in this domain. Um, in terms of discretization procedure, um, what we mean by this is that uh, we, we design a system 
um, to sort of have a good compensator and we design that in the S plane and then we discretize the result make it into a digital equivalent so we're assuming we've got the sampling operation going on um, and we're feeding the result through a zero to hold into the plant to get its piecewise continuous signal so this is the model we assume we will use to implement the system uh, and then the, the methods that we discussed last time give us ways to go from here to here based on, 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 on this assumption that this is the way it's going to work. So in MATLAB uh, we can do this fairly easily. Let's take a, a simple transfer function p over s plus p. Then if p is 5 let's say and ds is then the transfer function of p over 1 plus p. 1 s plus p this is how you should interpret this. Uh, let's take the sampling frequency to be 20 times p divided by 2 pi. Um, so it's about 20 times the, the, the size of the pole. The sampling frequency is 1 over f of s. And we can use that sampling frequency then to, to derive a continuous, uh, a discrete transfer function, use this function c to d. It takes a continuous transfer function or state space model or zero pole gain model and produces a equivalent z transfer function model. Uh, ts is a sampling period, uh, a method is a string which defines what uh, what the which method we're going to use for the mapping. Uh, if we use minus one we get a general solution uh, where time is not defined. And then we can plot um, step response of this function or, the, or d of z on the same graph and see what happens to them. Um, in terms of the methods that MATLAB provides, uh, it provides a zero to hold method, which is given by this transfer function, 1 minus z to the minus 1 times the z transform of ds over s is effectively what that produces. We've got the bilinear transform which we got from numerical integration, so t over t, 1 minus z to the minus 1, 1 plus z to the minus 1 is substituted for s. That's called the Tustin method in MATLAB. And we've got match pole 0 using z equals e to the st, which is this function here. In addition to that, there's a few, there's three others methods, first order hold, impulse invariant, Tustin with pre-warp, which I'll leave you the documentation to have a look at. Uh, in the lect in open to the lecture, I'll actually run this script. I can't run it at the moment because MATLAB doesn't work on my home computer at, when I'm not on the network at, at the university. So I, I can't run this script to show you it in this presentation. I'll have to run it during the session. But what you will find is that uh, for, for very low frequencies, pretty much all of the digital, digital equivalents that give you the same kind of response. It's only at high frequencies when, when things tend to change. Um, I think the notes have some more information about when and where this, this sort of effect occurs. So that sort of concludes what I wanted to do for the pre-lecture pre, uh, session. Um, in the session itself, we, as I said, I'll show you that MATLAB comparison, but then I want to go through the design of a continuous compensator followed by discretization, I'll show you how that works. We'll use the MPZ method for that. Uh, I would like to show you how the digital compensator will actually be implemented. I want to discuss the limitations of continuous design. What, what point would we need to think about doing the design in the Z domain itself rather than in the S plane? And then I will show you how we would re redesign that compensator that we designed for the first example using the digital design approach. So that concludes the uh, pre-lesson. Uh, Hopefully it's useful to you. There is more information in the notes on Blackboard, which I'll leave you to read. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll carry on the discussion in the lecture by showing you some examples um, to illustrate what I've, I've been telling you in this, this session. So thanks for watching. I'll see you in, a, in, the, in the lecture itself. And uh, goodbye for now.